Okay, thanks, Rory. As Rory says, um, one element which was not mainstream part of the project was the development of a number of case studies. The case studies um, take elements of the dimensions, oh, sorry, take elements of the dimensions in uh, much more detail and are prepared basically as an additional resource. So if you get onto the, uh, the OECD, uh, sorry, the HE Innovate website, you will find um, a number of case studies that are all, have already been prepared and they're to supplement. So if you're interested, for example, in culture uh, within an organisation, uh, the first case study I'm talking about should, should pop up to on that one. Um, so I'm doing three case studies. Just because I've chosen to do uh, in conjunction with the, the department and with the OECD Dundalk, Tala and a joint one between UL and LIT doesn't mean that there weren't plenty of other good things that I could have concentrated on. Um, it just so happens that we've done these and I, I admit to a degree of selfishness that I had academic curiosity to, to, to look at some of these. What I'm going to do is, I've only got four or five, six slides most for the case study, I'm going to take about five minutes uh, for, for, the, for what I've worked on. Uh, there'll be a URL that will come up, I'll give you my email address at the end, and if you want to contact me, I'll tell you where to go to to get, the, to get much more detail. They are written to a template, prepared to a template, prepared by the OECD, so they're around about three and a half thousand words, um, and they do have a structure, they do have a beginning, a middle, and an end, and I'll, go, I'll step through the main findings in those. So I'm going to start with one case study, which is Dundalk, I'm going to stop at that stage, and I'm going to ask Anne-Marie McHugh, who's been heavily involved in uh, the, the whole entrepreneurship, behaviours, culture, and so on within Dundalk, and she's just going to give us a little bit more flavour about what has been done in Dundalk. I'll move to Tala, and Jack MacDonald, who is the Industrial Liaison Manager, is here in the audience, and he'll just give us a little bit more about that. They'll be short, sharp presentations. Um, unfortunately, unless somebody from UL stroke LIT is here from the senior management group, uh, they, they weren't able to come unless there was a sharp no, uh, short notice, so I'll, I'll step through that particular particular case study. Um, the first one, as I said, is around about Dundalk, and one of the things which intrigued me about, has intrigued me for a long while about Dundalk, is that um, this is really a question of culture beating strategy every single time. That for a long time, Dundalk, whatever it was doing, was, has been able to develop a, a real uh, cultural change in, in students and staff's behaviours and mindsets around how they think about entrepreneurship. So that was the study, that was the, the case study in the, in the first instance. Um, they themselves will, will argue uh, 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 very persuasively that what they're building is, a, is an ecosystem and the ecosystem begins with leadership, uh, it's, it's embedded in the schools and we'll see how in a moment. Um, Staff were involved, there's cross-disciplinary action. Um, st the students are intimately involved in a number of initiatives. Um, they've been recognised as having probably one of the strongest relationships uh, through their incubation centre into enterprise um, and into the regional development centre. So it's a sort of a, a virtuous uh, circle right the way through it. And it is truly an ecosystem, although I hate that term applied to, 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 to non-biological systems. Um, in terms of setting cultural expectations, uh, you sort of name check, or one name checks a strategic plan, and they have three core strategic themes, one of which is entrepreneurship. So it is set from the top, followed uh, very uh, obviously at a very high level um, uh, by a President's Award for the most enterprising student. Now these are not unique. You'll see, it, you'll see yourselves in a lot of these things. The important point here is that it's set from the top, and, and the, 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 the top sets the tone. Um, it's these sorts of high-level initiatives are embedded through a, a wide, wide range of student enterprise competitions, paperclip challenges, hackathons, all sorts of stuff, and that's all in that's all in the case studies. Um, in terms of being able to build a network of of people and groups. Um, They've done that through their business incubation facilities um, and, most importantly, through a student enterprise internship programme, which I think I'm correct in saying was borrowed from a model in Scotland. Um, and these, uh, this is peer-to-peer -peer, uh, student uh, interns, I think there's two or three of them. Uh, they are employed by the college, they do a master's, but half their job is also to work with uh, all their peers throughout the institution. People associate Dundalk with the ACE initiative. Um, they led out on that SIF project, with ob obviously with others involved. I think I'm correct in saying Sligo, DCU, uh, CIT, and uh, UCC were involved in that. And that has 
transformed into the CEEN network, which is um, taking over a lot of what they were doing. So they built up a wide range of, of synergies and networks. Um, in terms of embedding uh, within the academic uh, area, there's a number of things that I would, that I would point to. Um, key one at an early stage about five years ago was the establishment of a subgroup of the Academic Council whose sole responsibility was to make sure that any new programme that came up for development um, had embedded within it. So it was almost like audited or checked to make sure that it had uh, an entrepreneurship uh, uh, remit within it. Uh, you can point to, to obvious ones like entrepreneurship models, uh, entrepreneurship modules across, the, across all programmes. And we've had quite a lot of cross disciplinary uh, development. So, for example, um, business and humanities and engineering, two, to two sets of students come together to do, do student projects, accountancy students and engineering students. So not only is a, as an engineer to develop a widget, but the uh, accountancy student has to, um, uh, has to cost it and so on. So a lot of examples of that. And uh, same developments across other schools. In terms of impacts and lessons learned, just a thing about my take on, on measuring the impact and the valorization, if I can call it that, of this particular uh, set of case studies. Um, there's both qualitative and quantitative, and I'm sorry I missed your discussion on this, Paul, but what I tried to do was to see, can we use different ways of seeing what the impact is? Um, and across all the case studies, there are a number of very useful developments which have taken place in recent years. We have had institutional reviews, some of which note things, some of which commend things, and so they're there in the public record to say, well, this institution does this well, or that part of it does it, uh, does it even better. We also have the output of the strategic dialogue process. The first iteration of that actually um, made commendations. The second iteration, completed just at the back end of last year, simply notes things. So I've trawled through those to see where certain aspects were highlighted and so on. Um, so using that sort of matrix of impact uh, tools, uh, a number of things stand out. In the case of Dundalk, and, and Marie McHugh will talk about this, change doesn't happen overnight, culture doesn't change overnight, and they've been at this for a long while. In fact, you can probably trace it back to uh, the attendance at a conference uh, by a previous head of School of Business uh, and Humanities, Peter, Peter Fuller, um, in, in the mid-80s, um, and from that uh, there was this, this, this transformation over time. Um, secondly, there's a constant reinforcement of the message of entrepreneurship at a high level, uh, by, uh, at a strategic level, and across institute, whether it's at peer-to-peer -peer or whether it's through, uh, through student activities. The Academic Council Working Group gives it an academic validity and robustness, which means that uh, it stacks up when it comes to quality evaluation and so on. And I think, uh, and this is my take, it's not something that came from, from, GM, uh, from, from DKIT, I think it's important that, that, that the work that Dundalk has done, the fact that it's ec recognised externally, is also important to the institution. That's my suspicion. So external valorisation is a key component in this one. So that's the uh, URL. I won't ask you to take it down now, but as I say, I'll put up my email address at the end, and I'm certainly happy to forward them. So I'm going to swap over now to um, Anne-Marie and Anne-Marie is going to give us a few slides on a little bit more detail so where is where's your one Anne-Marie it was up there earlier on is it uh, that's Louis Michael Hayes no, it's the oh it's the DKIT one yeah there yeah. okay thanks very much Richard and thank you very much for the opportunity here He's made Dundalk sound fantastic, and Thank we know you. we are, but he made it sound really good, so much, much thanks for that. Um, so some of the stuff that I'm going to talk about has actually been mentioned, so what I'll do is really focus more on the, on the model of HE Innovate itself. Okay? So what I plan to talk about was just a brief overview, the journey of our education and um, entrepreneurship education in Dundalk, the HE uh, Innovate model itself, and just where we plan to go over the next while. Um, so we have four schools in Dundalk, the School of Business and Humanities is the biggest one, so we have 2,200 students out of a total of about 5,000, and that's where I sit. Um, although I actually went to college here in DCU many moons ago in engineering, and just to prove how small a place Ireland is, the next speaker is in the same class. So Jack and I shared a classroom many moons ago. Um, I suppose just the reason for this slide here is just to show the number of international students. 
So we've almost 900 international students out of 5,000. Um, so that has been a key area for us. Our journey in entrepreneurship education, as um, Richard had said, has gone back a long way. I'd like to think it's not to do with the fact that we live on the border and we've had to be quite entrepreneurial in our approach. And maybe with Brexit coming, we have, might have to be entrepreneurial again. Hopefully not. And hopefully Brexit won't happen. Um, but we have actually, over the last number of years, and it's something that's embedded. And to quote Brian last week in Brussels, Brian had one quote that was used about five times throughout the whole seminar. I um, hope I remember it now. It's uh, culture beats um, strategy for breakfast. So we've probably lived and breathed this for the last number of years. Um, and I suppose uh, I've had my own business myself, and a lot of people who teach entrepreneurship ha have had their own business. So as a result, you know, we're living and breathing it. We're not t teaching it from um, a theoretical point of view. So some of the game changers for us over the last number of years, ACE has been commended on many occasions, and, and it was led from Dundalk, as was mentioned um, previously. And we also then introduced the BSc in Engineering Entrepreneurship. And that was, you know, meeting of minds, entrepreneurs and engineers and business people. Um, as mentioned earlier, we have three themes that were set up a number of years ago. And internationalisation, as you've seen, we've achieved uh, well there. Sustainability would be part of our lovely windmill. Um, Rory mentioned earlier the lovely faci facilities that we have, and as the same as, as a lot of you guys. Um, and obviously entrepreneurship. So we've embedded entrepreneurship in every single module. So if you are, for example, studying in childhood education, there's a good chance you're going to be taught how to maybe come up with a crash, how to maybe run a programme, how you're going to be able to make money. Because I think Ireland Inc., we can't expect people to be given jobs. We have to create our own jobs ourselves. And we really try to enforce that message and embed that into our students as much as possible. Excuse me. Um, so seeing then was the next, from a funding point of view, seeing came after it is, and I see Bridget Kerrigan here, who led out in that, and Dundalk led out in that, after having led out on this. And then um, even Marie Vardy introduced with Peter Tiernan the DCU Master's Level of Entrepreneurship Educators. So two of our colleagues um, started off that in 2014, and I myself did it in 2015, and I see Chris Gibbons and Roisin Lyons, so we're, we're continuing spreading the message of that. I suppose one of the benefits to us of um, doing that course was to get the same consistent language across all the universities and HEs, and obviously to establish a really strong network of people that we met with. So that was really useful. Bringing it back then to DKIT, what we did was we set up um, an enterprise working group. <coughs> Excuse me. So this was led at academic council. So, you know, it's really coming from the top. There's no point in us at the bottom of the organisation trying to force policy and procedure right through. It has to come from the top. So when it was decided at Academic Council that we were going to do this, um, it, you know, it really engaged everybody with it. So we set it up, and what we did was we then got the, all the four schools to do a presentation on entrepreneurship, what was happening in the college. Because, you know, the very first picture shows how big the college is, I'm sure your own organisations are also logistically, you know, it takes a long time to get from one to the other. So we put everybody in the same room and we all did a presentation on what was happening in our own schools. It was a very positive exercise for us and it actually engaged a lot of minds and thoughts in the organisation as to how to see what everybody else is doing. When you see what somebody else is doing and it's pretty good, that gets you to up your own game. It's not like a bit of competition. So that worked really well. But what we felt was, and somebody mentioned earlier about you know, the lasso that you need, we didn't really have a measure. We're, we're business 8 out of 10, we're engineering 6 out of 10, or whatever. So HE Innovate just came along at a very good time for us to be able to measure, and not to compete against each other, but to see overall how entrepreneurial we were. So we introduced that, and we did that ourselves among the Enterprise Working Group. So for those who may not have seen it, and I might just ask, if you don't mind, for a show of hands, for the number of people who've actually implemented or used the survey just to get a feel. Okay, so probably less than one third. So there's obviously, you know, I'm sure you're going to be using this over the next while. So what I'm going to focus on now is how we actually implemented it. So as we mentioned earlier, there's seven different themes. That's what it looks like. So again, using the culture from the top down, the management set out the invitations, and they were, they were there at the initial meetings that were set out. We then wanted to create a baseline. So what we didn't want to do was kind of cheat the system and say, look, these are all the wonderful things we're doing in entrepreneurship. We want to just see what people think themselves. So we asked them, without telling them too much, we asked them to fill in the survey, which they did. We then have developed an action plan of how to improve the scores. So, you know, we know what we've got, and I don't mind sharing it with you. There's seven themes. We scored three out of five on five of them, and two out of five on two of them. 
The two, interestingly, that we did least one was measuring the impact, and we know how complex that is, right? And also then on the organisation capacity. And without going on about funding, here we go again, right? We've heard it a few times. That has an impact. Um, so if you want to do more things, it's difficult to have the organisation capacity unless you have the funding. So they were the two we scored least in. What we learned about doing it then was the language and, co and questions contained was not always understood. So for example, if you're a computing lecturer, you do not know how many spin-offs there's been from DKIT graduates. <coughs> if you're in the incubation centre and in the RDC, you absolutely have a handle on that. So it's just trying to get the right audience to the right questions. Initially, the lack of user friendliness, it wasn't great, I have to say. You had to show people how to get onto the next page, how to get onto the next thing. And I suppose through us asking some maybe awkward questions, we were invited to go to EU, and now Dundalk represents Ireland, or with the Irish representatives, out of a 15 strong facilitation team. We've made a lot of improvements in that, and the tool that we have now is a lot more user, uh, user friendly. So that's been very positive, and I certainly commend the work that's been done with Dennis and his team, a fellow Monaghan person. Um, so the timing of the survey is crucial. In the world of academia, there's times where we're up to here and you have windows of opportunity. So you pick your time very carefully if you'd want to try to engage your audience. And we learned that uh, from that. Um, logistically, you won't have all staff members timetable to have an hour off at the one time. It just won't happen. So you have to be resourceful and entrepreneurial and think about how am I going to get through that. And then what the website then, when we come up with you know, the certain scores, we kind of said, well, where do we get the answers now? And the HE Innovate webpage itself was really, really useful to actually give you some good solutions. But we had to localise that and make sure one solution doesn't fit all, that we actually make that apparent to what will work in DKT and what you know, there's too many barriers for. So our next steps is we've actually committed to the HEA that we're going to do this as part of a compact. Okay, so it's a big, big bold step first, but I think if you really want to engage people, you have to do it from the top down, and that will engage everybody else. So that's been done literally as we speak. We're also going to identify a champion in each of the schools to own this project, because one person can't do all. And we're going to approach different uh, ways of doing it. So one of the things that I took from one of the sessions we had in Brussels recently was, maybe only of the seven themes, only do one. So you could just look at the entrepreneurial teaching and ask the entrepreneurial teachers what they think, so that you really base it on that. And then maybe you, you go to the RDCs and the incubation centres. So there's different approaches, you know, you don't have to do it the same way. We're going to set up lab workshops, maybe we'll get a cup of tea and a cup of coffee and get people into a lab and get them to actually do the presentation or the survey itself. We have to think outside the box. We need to engage the lecturers, the academic staff, the non-academic staff, and very importantly, the students. The students are the reason that we are sitting in where we are now. So we need to engage them and see are we doing them the service that we need. Are we having an impact on the students themselves? We're going to do an institute wide and an action plan will be agreed with senior management. Um, Rory talked earlier about trying to all the good messages that are going out in all the universities and the HEIs in Ireland. But how do we send that message out? Is it notice boards? Is it Facebook? Is it whatever? We need to be a bit more creative in how we're going to get the message out. So we need the actions to be visible and communicated. And we need to think about you know, introducing entrepreneurship as a really valid way of actually people having a, an opportunity to develop a career. The jobs may be created at the moment, but we don't know when the next recession is going to be. So we need to make sure that people are more entrepreneurial and thinking about business in a different way. Okay. So just finally, for people who are thinking of setting it up, learn from what we did. Um, try to secure buy-in at all levels, particularly at the top. You know, we had an open door. We really did. From Dennis Cummins and the people before him and the people after, they were all engaged in this. So it was easy to some point. Devise a workable calendar, plan the timing of events. You know when works in your own organisation. You know when doesn't work, so you just work it. Consider taking themes and owners. You know, so, as I said, maybe the entrepreneurial teaching done by the entrepreneurs who are the, or the teachers who are teaching it. Communicate, communicate, communicate. Um, it's said that you, to get the same message out, you need to tell people six different ways. So what's the six different ways we need to do it? Um, ensure the champions drive the initiative continually. You know, there's been different things that have come into colleges over different times, but we want this one to stay. We want this one to be there in five or ten years' time. That's one of the game changers in DKIT over the next while. And celebrate our successes. 
We're not so good in Ireland at doing that. You know, we need to do a bit more of that. Blow our own trumpet. Um, but it's nice when the OECD blow the trumpets of everybody else. So we appreciate you taking the time to do that. Okay, so that's my short and sharp presentation. I'll be happy to take questions at the end. Thanks, Anne Marie. Are we, Rory? Are we okay to take questions at the end, or what would you want to do? Okay. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll go on then. Okay. Um, second case study is around uh, the Institute of Technology in Tala. Um, Tala is one of the younger institutes of technology, only established in 1990. Um, and what has been very obvious from the very beginning is this, the way in which Tala uh, ha has engaged uh, with, with the region around it in, in, in southwest Dublin. And um, a number of years ago, I was fortunate to chair the, the first institutional review of Tala, and it struck me then how strongly they have developed this comprehensive approach, almost a cradle-to-grave approach, to being able to engage with the external environment, uh, inside out, outside in, and so on. So that really is the, the subject of the, the second case study. Um, I've just threw up, this is t taken out of uh, the uh, strategic plan for Tyler 2009-2014, and just one thing I would point to in that is this, oh, does this thing work here? Maybe it doesn't, but if you go down to B3, a clear statement about a comprehensive enterprise development framework. So there's, a, there's something that's put straight out there that this has to be cradled to grave in the way that, the way that it's done. Um, I'm, I'm, are you smiling, Jack, because you don't recognise your institution? Fantastic <laughs> job. So the, the heart of this component of the case study, I think it, it's probably true to say, is the Synergy Centre. Um, and they've developed a reputation for being very proactive in terms of business development events. Um, and there's a constant stream of things happening in it. Um, so the, the brand, if I can call it that, of the Synergy Development Centre has become quite strong for what is one of the smaller institutes, let's be honest about that. Um, something else that mightn't be as well known, is, and that is that when the institutes were established, one of the, the, the requirements in the external examining process was that there would be one academic and one external person as an extern on each um, uh, uh, program. Um, I think it's fair to say that most of the institutes, and my own uh, Sligo would have certainly been there, most of the institutes dispensed with that years ago because it was very difficult to get it. Tala has held on to that uh, and still retains uh, external examiners coming from the world of work as part of the external examination process and that can't but help to, 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 to um, ground uh, what the work that they're doing. Um, I think it's fair to say that most institutes of technology and, and probably the, uh, universities well, are members of their local chamber of commerce or their, their, their um, uh, regional division of IBEC or something. What is unusual in Tala's case is that um, uh, the, the, the president of the chamber of commerce in South County Dublin has been the president of IT Tala. So to make that a very high level commitment externally is somewhat unusual um, and uh, is a reflection of where they're at. In terms of partnerships and relationships, what really struck me when I visited uh, Tala for this particular project was the extent to which uh, both, e both external people are comfortable with inside uh, Tala and Tala are comfortable with having external people coming in uh, and being part of, of, of their processes. I think it's fair to say that most institutions would not would feel somewhat uncomfortable being as open as Tala appear to be with their colleagues in uh, whether it's uh, South County Dublin uh, Enterprise, the local uh, enterprise office. Um, and this has is, this is emerged in a number, a number of ways. Um, the South Dublin Student Enterprise Wards are a very significant sponsorship by uh, Tala. There's pretty big money uh, being put into that, not just money but activity, and in turn uh, the um, Synergy Centre's Enterprise Awards scheme is sponsored by the local enterprise office. So there's that two-way two street. Uh, I won't mention New Frontiers. A lot of other colleges are doing that. Um, the, again, all colleges have incubators and science parks. So what I'm saying here in relation to Tala does, it is mirrored across most, if not all, of the other colleges. I just stress the point again that what strikes me about Tala is that it is cradle to grave. It's an integrated approach. 
Uh, that's not always the case elsewhere. The other thing that is important in Tala's case is that um, having developed Synergy Centre, which is, I suppose, a step-in type of facility, um, they've moved from being minority shareholders to majority owners of what they call Synergy Global, which is an incubation centre located in City West business campus. So uh, probably a little bit like DCU and the Ryan Academy, they're, they're stepping out as opposed to having people step in, and that's quite a, a, a significant um, uh, development. Um, students are involved in this, and interestingly, the students are involved not necessarily always through their academic programs, but directly into the incubation centre. And that, that, again, is probably somewhat unusual. Two types there. There's the normal sort of business development type one, which is the Synergy Student Award, but they also have a, a summer uh, programme for, for, for um, undergraduates wanting to move into entrepreneurship development and so on. So that's, I think, a six-week programme. Uh, is it six week, I think I'm correct in saying, Jack? And that's a sort of an in-house summer school uh, for, for, for graduate entrepreneur development. In terms of impact, again, there's impact that is, is uh, accessible both in qualitative and quantitative terms. Um, let's deal with the quantitative ones here. Uh, Tala has done extremely well using the Knowledge Transfer Ireland metrics and performs probably across the board as amongst the best of the institutes. Uh, in terms of all the sort of quantitative metrics, but it has also uh, been commended highly in terms of its institutional review processes and in terms of its uh, strategic um, uh, dialogue compacts and commendations and notes. Um, in terms of lessons to learn, my take on this is that there is a, a, a pretty much a cradle-to-grave approach, that they've built a resilient network um, even when I was there, you could see discussion going on uh, between the different parties, and they were quite comfortable arguing the toss over something. There was no defensiveness, so they built, they've obviously built up a, a shared trust in what they're doing. Um, Tala, when Tala was built first, it was built with a wall around it. And it's curious how something small can make such a difference. A key part of that wall was removed, <coughs> which has opened up the back of the campus in and out of the older village in Tala. And it was interesting to see people moving in and out. So it's curious how something physical and its removal can have, a, can have an impact, and that's been good. And the other thing I would point to is the success, success of Synergy Global, and that's the step out piece, which I think is very good. So I'm going to stop it at that, and I'm going to hand over to Jack, who is going to, talk, to give us a little bit more uh, detail on Tala. Uh. Is that your one? Yeah. And from... Okay. And I just use this one here. Yeah, he wants you to stand there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Richard, and thank you, Amory. And I, I'm glad that Amory was discreet enough not to mention what year we graduated <laughs> from back here in, in what was then the NIHE, uh, Dublin. Um, suffice it to say, it, it wasn't today or yesterday, and there was, I think at the time we had the Albert College building and the Henry Grattan building, but there was a lot of green field space here at the time that's, that's all tra completely transformed uh, today. So look, my, my name is, is Jack MacDonald. I am uh, responsible for, loosely speaking, for applied research, enterprise and innovation with the Institute of Technology in, in Tala. And I wanted to use just one or two slides. Richard did mention that I only have, well, he said five minutes, five to ten minutes. So, <laughs> so, so I've, only brought, I've only brought 20 slides, and I'm going to have to maybe rush through them. I wanted to just, for people who, who may not know IT Tala, just to put it in context and explain who we are. So we're probably a mid-sized institute of technology within the Irish uh, Institute landscape. We would serve or have a, a, a student base or student body of about 5,500 students, of which 3,000 would be full-time students, mainly coming through from second level and through the CAO system into the college. And then 2,500, which is probably large and as, as when compared to other institutes of technology, who would be on lifelong learning, back to education, you know, taking courses in education on a part-time access basis. Um, and then we would also service uh, about 200 postgraduate students, of which 
relatively small number by, by university standards, but of which about 60 to 70 are on either uh, master's or PhD programs by, by research. Um, the Institute would, would see itself very much as being embedded within the region. So Tala is a suburb, if you like, on the southwest outskirts of, of Dublin, just outside the M25. And we would see ourselves being very much uh, a key player integrated with the community, uh, creating access opportunities to third level education for local students and, and, and families, and then very much integrated and embedded as well with the economic activity in the region and working with local enterprise and, and industry and creating all kinds of opportunities in, in that regard. Um, just to mention on, 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 on this slide that, um, and I'll just bring everything up together, that when it comes to our strategic plan, somebody mentioned earlier that it's important that initiatives in terms of enterprise, innovation, entrepreneurship and so on are supported from the top down and that that sets the, the tone and helps set the culture within the organisation. Um, in our case, it's no different. And if you pick up our strategic plan, you will see that up there alongside teaching and learning, we also have uh, uh, research and applied research up there as one of the three pillars of the Institute on an equal footing, prioritised on an equal basis. And then over on the right hand side on the bottom, we have support for enterprise and innovation, again, equally prioritised top down by the senior management team within the Institute. Um, a lot of what, and, and Richard made this point, I'll just say it again, a, a lot of the things I talk about here in brief, um, you, you, you will probably find are common to your own institutes and universities, uh, and you might think humdrum, what's, what's different, we're doing that ourselves, and you will recognize a lot of, uh, a lot of what uh, you're doing in, in what I'm speaking about here today. But what I'll try to do, therefore, is pick out one or two uh, examples of where we might just be different and where we can experiment with new and, and possibly, or hopefully, innovative approaches. So I'll start by talking about uh, Synergy Centre, which is our on-campus uh, business incubation unit. So today we would have roughly 16-odd companies and residents in the Synergy Centre in, in, in dedicated uh, office units we would separately then have about the same amount of companies in Synergy Global, which is the step-out facility on the City West business campus. And a model that we found has worked very well for our early stage enterprises is that having spent a couple of years as embryonic early stage companies on the campus, a lot of them want to shed that image and are ready to move on and move, to, move off campus. And it's, 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 proved, it's probably proved a greater success than we ever thought it might do in the beginning in, in terms of being able to move them on, not lose the connection, and help them transition into the, the big bad world that is out there. Because the kind of terms and, and supports that we can offer them in our facility in City West are much friendlier to it, but what is still an early stage company than they might get just in the open market, if you like. Um, the other innovation, and it's, 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 it's probably one worth underlining in terms of even this graphic on the slide, is that we have co-located the Enterprise Incubation Centre with uh, an Applied Research Centre. So if you like, the right-hand side of the graphic here is Synergy Centre. The left-hand side is the Centre of Applied Science for Health, which is a research facility. And we're hoping that, and it's, you know, we, we started into this about three to four years ago, we're trying to create those opportunities for, literally for synergy, for, for uh, casual conversations and meetings between researchers and academics and entrepreneurs and, and people coming through programs such as New Frontiers on the campus and so on. And all of that is proving its worth in, in practice. And what I will do, uh, and I might have to skip through some slides here, but what, some of the slides I want to focus on at the end have to do with actual case studies of companies that have proven the model of, of, of how it makes sense for particular early stage high tech companies to be on the campus and to work with our, you know, and benefit from, from the kind of supports and research services they, they can access on the campus. So these slides I'll skip through, those are just some graphics of the uh, images of the, of the incubation facilities. 
Um, in total, we would have about 35 to 40,000 square feet of dedicated enterprise and innovation uh, 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 space, both on and off, uh, off campus. New Frontiers is an entrepreneurship development program, again, nationally promoted and, and branded by Enterprise Ireland. I won't dwell on that again because most people in the room are probably familiar with that program and we run it obviously within the South and West Dublin region. Um, we would, again, within Synergy Centre, it's probably bread and butter stuff for most of you, we are running a, a, a busy program and calendar of events on an ongoing basis for our resident entrepreneurs and companies and for promoters coming through the various entrepreneurship programs, etc. Um, we've also co-located in the same facility with with the incubator, we've co-located what, what is called a technology gateway. And again, many people in the room are probably familiar with this concept. So the gateways are basically business development or access points that are funded by Enterprise Ireland to try and allow, to create some bandwidth, if you like, for, for us as an institute to go out and speak to companies and develop you know, value-adding research projects or indeed not just research but you know help companies to access equipment and services and expertise and consultancy and all of that kind of stuff they might be able to benefit from by coming and talking to us on the campus so the gateway doesn't really fund research per se but it funds in our case a team of four people in the in, in our case it is thematically focused in biodiagnostics so looking at applications in and I have a few of them listed here in human uh, diagnostics, infectious disease, and veterinary diagnostics, uh, spanning through environmental water testing, uh, pharmaceuticals, food and dairy science. We, we, we're developing and, and have research expertise across a whole range of different areas, mainly dealing with biosensors and electrochemical sensor technology. Um, but again, the gateway is there, it's, it's, it's on the doorstep of the companies, the early stage enterprise on the campus, and again, those kind of interactions are taking place, and there's a two-way kind of push-pull, the gateway, the people there are, are focused to go out and bring in projects, and likewise, the companies are typically looking for solutions, and that's where the, the real synergy and, and, and benefit tends to derive from. Those are just some logos of the kind of companies we would have worked with through the gateway in the last um, in the last 12 months alone we've put i think top of my head maybe 27 odd projects with 19 companies in last year alone were funded and financed and delivered through the technology gateway and again i i i need to speed up through this there, we, we have lots of case study material that i'm happy to share again with people uh afterwards of projects of how companies came and talked to us and how we were able to understand the requirements and, and scope out projects and deliver solutions ultimately at, at the end of the day. Uh, many, a lot of what we do, and, and most people in the room will, will be experts in the same area, we're good at tapping into state funding and when companies come to talk to us, one of the benefits they get is they can talk to us about not only what their problem is, but how we can help them get, you know, draw down funding to, to, to find a solution for that problem. So we're tapping into, to be honest, mainly in, in true Enterprise Ireland into programs such as the Innovation Voucher, the Innovation Partnership Program, the Commercialization Fund Program, and so on, to fund very commercial, very, very, you know, high impact projects that are delivering results for, for companies. Um, the other thing we're, we're, we're trying to do more of, we're not fully there yet, but we, we, like many of you in the room, have a lot of very high value, high tech equipment, scientific equipment and the, and the likes on the campus. And we're trying to open that up and bring more and more companies in, A, to, to make them aware it's there in the first instance, but B, to make it available, because a lot of it isn't fully utilized all of the time by, by undergraduate or postgraduate students to bring companies in and allow them to avail of that equipment, typically on a paid up basis. So it's not that we're giving it away free of charge, but that at least they can access this equipment within the, within the region. Um, and I know I'm probably um, over time, but I have just four case studies. If I could just indulge you for, for a few more minutes to talk through each of these. 
Um, so Insareb is the first one, and I have a picture up here of a, a chap called Jim Roach, who is from a medical hospital background, who set up this company about, I would say, four years ago now. And to give you an example, Jim would have come to meet us maybe around about 2012. We would have co-opted him onto the New Frontiers program, which he took within Synergy Centre. Um, he would have been the first client to come in and take space within our innovation labs. So within Synergy and, and, the, and the adjoined research facility, we not just have office space and hot desk space, but we also have laboratories, wet laboratories and tech laboratories that can be customized to, to a client's need. So Jim was the first tenant, if you like, to use our new innovation labs. He would have run at least two innovation vouchers, a co-funded voucher and a feasibility study, and then some contract research projects with science, with, with, with the gateway, with engineering, over a period of two to three years, um, also while developing out his, his product line. And what Jim has developed is, is his, his business is in um, infant, neonatal infant care and building, building um, uh, monitors to, to measure seizures in very small or premature babies. And he's managed to come up with an innovative product that in, in effect he outsourced the entire R&D for that product to engineers and to scientists working on campus within the institute. And he was able to do it and bootstrap, if you like, um, all the way along. He's now raised over one and a half million euros worth of funding. He's moved from Synergy Centre up to Synergy Global in City West. Um, he was back in last week talking to the creative digital media people to get them to create a video to promote his business. So he's, he's bootstrapped all the way along using the resources of the, of the institute. Um, a second example, and I, I know, and I will speed up. I'll go quicker, Richard. Allergen Biotech are a company in the uh, food allergen space. Started out again through New Frontiers. Ben Teeling, who's pictured here, would have come through as a graduate of IT Tala. Um, would have started out testing for peanut allergies and then moved on to gluten allergies and has been involved in a very extensive innovation partnership project, which is ongoing as we speak. Uh, drawing down funding of over 100,000 over the past 12 months. We would have been involved in several pre earlier projects that he funded himself or that were funded through innovation vouchers and so on. So another example of a company working in the centre and drawing down on maximising, if you like, its, its benefit from the supports available on, on campus. Um, third example, very different in this case, a spin-out from a large corporate base beside us in Tala called Henkel. Those are the guys that make the, the Loctite glue, Henkel Loctite you might have heard of. Um, so these guys spun out a technology from Henkel, have lo located again within the innovation labs on campus, have raised quite a bit of VC money, and they're developing a, a line of <coughs> medical grade adhesives and suturing products and so on that are, that are uh, going through regulatory approval as we speak. So again, they were able to avail of equipment, services, expertise on the campus, and also locate their business within our high-tech innovation labs. Um, and then the final example, a uh, company in a very different space, this is in the photovoltaic or, or solar cell um, space, a company called Nines Engineering, who have developed some very, very uh, novel technology. The solar cell industry is a very dirty, wet chemical in terms of manufacturing industry, mainly products are mainly manufactured and sourced out of, the, out of Southeast Asia today. So um, Nines were able to develop a new technology using silicon and semiconductor type uh, uh, expertise to, to dry etch uh, photovoltaic cells. And again, they've been with us for three to four years. They've been in office space. They've been in laboratory space. They've just now developed a new clean lab facility. We couldn't house them in the Synergy Center, so we found them a new unit back in the main institute building, and we've customized and developed that out together with them to help them develop out their product line. So, and I am done now, but that was just, to, to those, those few examples were just to try and make real the kind of innovation, what can happen in practice by, you know, in, encouraging uh, interaction at all levels, if you like, between the academics and the researchers on campus and the companies who are co-located right next door to them on the same campus 
and you know really does drive real value for these companies and you can you can see it really in in, in these few few live examples so that's all i have richard i'm sorry for maybe going over time a bit Okay, the final um, case study that uh, um, I worked on was one involving UL and LIT. In fact, it, uh, in, in truth, it also involves Mary Immaculate College. Um, but in terms of the biggest impact in things like Limerick for IT, Limerick for Engineering, it has been UL, it has been LIT, so therefore I'm concentrated on that. Um, Anybody in the business uh, of higher education now can't have failed to have been reminded about the Shannon Consortium. Uh, it's put forward on, on many occasions, and it's interesting to see where it came from and why it happened and, and how it happened. Um, Shannon Consortium, the relationship between UL and LIT, arose out of the opportunities that were created in the Strategic Innovation Fund uh, to have collaborative activities going. Those of you who were involved in PRTLI will know that money was, uh, points were set aside for collaborative working, the same way with Strategic Innovation Fund. It happened that as uh, SIF uh, was getting going, Maria Hinflar, the then president of Limerick, um, and Professor Roger Downer, the then president of, of uh, sorry, Limerick IT, uh, and Roger Downer, then president of the University of Limerick, had a very good working relationship. And so they took the initiative as presidents of their institutions on behalf of their city to try to see what they could do uh, in terms of uh, dealing with some of the social and economic issues that, uh, that the Limerick uh, was and to a certain extent still does face. Um, those personal commitments to doing this were uh, reinforced over a number of years with, stri with strategy statement commitments to collaboration. So these were sort of put out publicly, and the two institutions were therefore almost honor bound uh, to carry on doing that. And they found uh, manifestation also in uh, the Limerick Charter, which was an initiative uh, by a variety of stakeholders in Limerick, and they all signed up to this, so basically to work on behalf of the citizens of Limerick. Um, the Shannon Consortium is underpinned by quite a robust memorandum of understanding, um, and it commits to deep and formalized alliances across a range of core areas. So these are the things that are not easy to back out of. It's not that it's going to be a, something that is a, f a flavor of the month. This is something that is long term and um, is there to stay. Um, in order to oversee this, the committee, the, the presidents of the three institutions have a, a, a committee which meets every two months, which is quite regular given the, the busy uh, schedule that presidents of, uh, of higher education institutions have. And the work of, of this board um, is, is supported by an implementation board which is people like the registrars, VPs, research, and so on, and they meet also every two months, and then there's various working groups. So there's quite a, a strong structure of governance around uh, what is happening in, in Limerick. Um, in terms of what it looks like on the ground, um, there's been quite a number of significant initiatives that have been name-checked in things like this, the skill strategy. Um, so we have Limerick for IT, which was a very interesting initiative. Um, it was about future-proofing businesses within the Limerick area. So it wasn't looking at the now. It was going out to companies and saying, what are the things you need to do if you're to continue to attract investment into Limerick in the future? Um, so it was about investing in enterprise support and enterprise development in the longer term. <coughs> Limerick for Engineering is more recent and it follows a similar model, but it's not confined just to outward-looking uh, developments. There's been a number of initiatives which have been internal. Um, as a result of the initial teacher education review, uh, the three Limerick HEIs have, have established a National Institute for Studies in Education. Um, there is a federated Limerick Graduate School which is going to be awarding the PhDs in each of the three institutions um, and uh, have already started to do so, I think I'm correct in saying, in the case of LIT. 
Um, and then, uh, I suppose, the most obvious public manifestation of this, uh, this, this, inst this organization's activity is the shared procurement of utilities, which has been commented upon by the CNAG as an example of good practice. That's when people think of the Shannon Consortium, they think of buying gas, electricity, but there's an awful lot more behind it than that, and it's, and it's uh, very good stuff. In terms of the impacts, it's hard to ignore the impacts that uh, the, what has happened in Limerick uh, in terms of shared governance developments has had in terms of visiting panels. So uh, you do get some rather interesting statements being made. Uh, the, the original CIF evaluation, uh, the partners can think as a group, which I think is quite an interesting uh, 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 way of looking at things. Um, in terms of strategic dialogue, compact, very strong on job creation, and the regional cluster is, oper is operational, performing strongly. Interestingly, there's a bit of a, a discussion going on, is it the Shannon Consortium, is it the Limerick Cluster, what is it? It really doesn't matter what it is or what it's called. It probably suits some to call it some things and not others. The important point is there are a collective of institutions that are working on behalf of the citizens uh, in the area that they, that they, that they serve. Um, so I'm going to leave it at that. That's just very, very high level take on, three, on the three case studies. Um, uh, if you want, that's probably the easiest email address of the many that I use, uh, thorn.richard at IT Sligo. Uh, and I've said nothing about Sligo. Uh, so if you, want to get, if you want copies of this, just uh, send me an email. Um, otherwise, do a route around on the, on the HE Innovate website. Thanks, Robert.